UFC Vegas 98. This is the weigh in recap show, full card predictions, and the betting breakdown. I'm looking forward to talking about each of the matchups on this card after seeing the fighters on the scales. So make sure you guys smash the like button. If you're new, subscribe, turn the post notifications on, and make sure you share the video too. And also, note I'm going to be live for the whole UFC Vegas 98 fight card Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Don't miss the fight companion. Yes, I'm still displaced. The hurricane came through and uh, shut my power off, unfortunately. But I'm still bringing the fire, and I'm going to be right here doing the fight companion if the power's not back on. So you're not missing a thing. I'm not missing a beat. Also, we got to note something. Josh Fremd versus Abdul Razak Al-Hassan. Dunzo. Fight's not happening. Frem came in overweight, wasn't medically cleared to fight. It's disappointing because I thought Al Hassan by KO was a money prop and a most likely outcome, and I miss the violence of Al Hassan. He just can't seem to get it right. No contest with Brundage last time, and then this one here, fight gets canceled the day before because of a botched weight cut for Frem. Disappointing to say the least, but it's all good. We got plenty of fun fights to talk about. We're going to jump right into things. Starting the card off, we have... Clayton Carpenter versus Lucas Hocha. I've been picking the side of Clayton Carpenter to beat a Lucas Hocha. Though I think Hocha is a talented prospect and I like his striking, I feel as though Carpenter is simply more fine-tuned with his fighting skills. Even though he doesn't have as much experience on paper, he's the older guy. And yes, Hocha has a lot of experience on the lower-level Brazilian circuit, but Carpenter's over at MMA Lab, and I think he probably is better trained. And he's got a nice win from Contender. End of series. Listen, beating Edgar Shirez is impressive now. At the time that he had beat him, this is pre UFC Shirez, and he did good work. He outdogged him. To see now that win, age actually better than you would have anticipated. Last time, Carpenter beat one Camilo Ronderos, who, you know, is maybe similar ish level to Lucas Hosha. I think this is a fight that Carpenter is probably on point in. I'm expecting him to outdog a Hosha and take a W home. He's the older guy, not as much fight experienced, but it's not simply about fight experience. I think it's overall skill set, and I think that Carpenter just being a little bit more experienced in his full developed body is going to be physically stronger. I expect better wrestling, and I expect a winning game plan. I'm going for Carpenter to win. I think he's a relatively good prospect, and I think he can probably outdog a Lucas Hosha. Now, we are going to look at the scales. We'll check these fighters out. We'll see how the weigh-ins looked. Both guys on weight. We got the king of the nerds, Lucas Hosha, stepping on the damn scale. And then we got Clayton Carpenter on the other side looking absolutely jacked and shredded, man. The dude's in great shape. And I don't know. I just think he's a more physically imposing threat, you know? There's like uh, a relative difference in the size, side by side, like muscularity to body fat ratio. Night and day, Clayton Carpenter is going to be more physically fit. I think he's definitely stronger. And I feel like those are big factors to consider when you have a battle of prospects here. Yes, 17-1 on paper for Hosha. I don't think the record's what matters. Carpenter is 7-0, and I think simply he's better. And I'm expecting him to beat a Hosha. He could end up subbing him. I don't think submission is a crazy call. Now, it's not me saying the submission is the lock on this fight, but if you want to avoid the chalky bet, Minus 222 for Clayton Carpenter, where Hocha's plus 187. Now, when I look at things, I'm like, okay, that submission is, you know, better than playing a damn money line. Is it the greatest uh, likelihood of success bet ever at 5 to 1, though? It catches your eye. So you can chase big plus money on a sub call, which I think is live. Now, yeah, did I say decision? Yes, but that doesn't mean submission is impossible. And I'm not going to prop bet Carpenter by decision at plus 130. I'd rather degen bet it and go for the sub at plus 500. Listen, I called it with Ryan Spann in the same type of way on last week's weigh-in recap. And I'm feeling something similar here with Clayton Carpenter. Minus 222, so it's more of a parlay piece down the center with the money line. The over-unders are not really catching my eye in this one. I would rather stay away. I'm going either D-Gen, throw that sub prop in, or you're just going straight down the center and you're riding with Clayton Carpenter as a chalky bet. 
or a chalky parlay piece. Either way, I think he's getting it done. Clayton Carpenter to start us off with a W. He's taking out Brazil in this fight, you know? One for the uh, savages, zero for the nerds after this one here. Let's get to the next one. We got Dan Argetta versus Cody Haddon. Throughout the week, I've been picking the side of Dan Argetta as an underdog, and today he missed weight. He came in at 138 and a half, and by God, he better get those weight cuts on point because he is not a damn featherweight. We saw him at featherweight get absolutely bodied by Damon Jackson and an evident size difference between the two. Jackson's like six feet tall. Argetta's 5'7". I think he's 5'6 and a half, 5'6". Cody Haddon's a decent prospect, but I am not sold on him beating a Dan Argetta just yet because I think Argetta's pressure wrestling could get to Haddon. I think he could time some key takedowns. I think he could outdog him. I think he could outwork him. And I think that the physical strength difference is going to be evident. And I got to ride with Argetta, who comes from uh, the savage wrestling base. You know, Cody Haddon's stand up is his base of his game. Though he does have relatively good jujitsu, the skill set of Argetta's wrestling is clearly better than Haddon's. The jujitsu offensively from the bottom from Haddon, I'm not thinking is a viable threat. So it's Haddon striking from mid to long range to succeed in this fight. Is he going to knock Dan Argetta out? I don't love the chance of it. Argetta can take a good shot, and we're going to look at the scales, and you're going to see Dan Argetta is built like a little Mack truck. The dude is stacked. We'll pull it up right here. Let's look at these scales. So we got Haddon coming in great shape, looking smooth. He's an absolute Chad. I like the little mustache. He's rocking. He doesn't look creepy with a mustache, so there's some aura points for Haddon out the jump. Okay, Dan Argetta does look creepy with a mustache. I won't lie to you. He looks like an absolute little freak on this damn scale. I didn't love the look. I didn't love the look for Argetta. He's got bug eyes. The weight cut, he's at 38 and a half. And it seems like it got to him a bit, especially when you look in his eyes. He looks soulless. It's freaking me out a little bit staring at him. I got to scroll down. What the hell? And let's look at the side by side. You can see the main difference in physiques is Argetta's a thicker guy. Botched weight cut worries me because why is Dan Argetta coming in off weight like this? Why is he at 38 and a half? Now, I will tell you, watching the weigh-in, I did not see Dan Argetta uh, losing balance or looking near death on the scale. He seemed a little bug-eyed. We'll give him that. He came in overweight at 38 and a half. It is what it is. Am I going to jump ship on the pick because of it? I won't lie. The betting side of me is more concerned now. Even though a lot of times you favor the guy who missed weight, I don't love how Argetta looked on the scales irregardless of this weigh-in, but I'm not a bitch, okay? I am not pick-flipping. I'm sticking with the underdog, Dan Argetta, because I do believe what I'm saying is facts. He could out-wrestle Haddon. We don't know how Cody Haddon is going to deal with a beast in Argetta with wrestling pressure. Now, currently, Argetta's a plus 150 underdog. At open, it was even. Cody Haddon's the minus 175 favorite. If I'm looking at things, and I'm thinking this to myself, we're probably going to the later stage. I believe over two and a half is likely at minus 165. Regardless of what betting side you're on, I think we can agree the over is a high likely outcome. Dan Argetta definitely going to be a problem with his pressure wrestling. There's another side of the equation that I also wanted to discuss as we brought up the odds. Argetta by decision plus 300. Now, historically, guys who come in with a calculated weight miss, not saying he definitely did it on purpose, but this would be a fight that it would make sense to have a calculated weight miss. Just saying, a calculated weight miss will give you round three cardio when if you would have tortured yourself to get down to 136 pounds, maybe you wouldn't have round three cardio. You feel what I'm saying, guys? You get the mentality? So Argetta to pull it off on the cards, I think is rather low. Live, and I do think he's probably going to come through and give a tough fight. Now, if you're on the side of maybe, eh, I'm not so sure. Okay, the 3.5 would I get a minus 135. It's live too. I think it is probably live. I think that we're going to see Dan Argetta take it by decision, and I could see it being 29 28, but then you're not getting the plus money. So, where's the fun in that? I like the plus money side. I like Dan Argetta plus 150. I think he takes it home. I think he's going to win as a dog. Yes, a little bit of worry because of this damn weight miss. You always have to be a little apprehensive when you see a guy bug eyed on the scale. 
but I don't think Dan Argetta is too damaged or too debilitated after this recent weigh-in. I think he'll be all right. So we're going with Dan Argetta to be determined AF in this one and take out Cody Haddon on a gritty decision in what should be a fun fight. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, we got the ladies going after it. We got Corey McKenna versus Julia Palastri. I've been picking the side of Julia Palastri to win. I just simply think she's a more physically imposing girl, more power, nastier kicking skills, stronger grappler. Corey McKenna might be more technical in wrestling, which is a factor I'll bring in to sell another point when we get to the betting odds. Now, how they match up, I think McKenna is going to be at a power disadvantage, but she's going to be okay from the outside. McKenna's not an absolute can. I mean, she won on the damn contender series. She had a little bit of hype coming into the UFC, and they threw her some really difficult matchups. I mean, you look, this loss, Amarim loss is a rough one. Now, granted, losing to Elise Reed two and a half years ago didn't look great. You know, she got some W's. I mean, all her wins are against girls who are no longer with the UFC. So it's not like she has high caliber wins. Palastri debuted against a really lit prospect. Knutson's got everybody excited. And Palastri was a dog in that fight. And she made it really close. So that's why I favor Palastri here with McKenna. I just think she put on a quality performance in a defeat against Knutson, somebody who, you know, she wasn't supposed to be competitive with. And now you give her Corey McKenna, who I think is going to be at a disadvantage in the grappling, specifically the physicality of it, okay? The actual technique of grappling, I don't think is a super wide gap, but Palastri is more of a finisher. If you look at women, there's certain women that just have like average builds, right? Even in a sense, skinny fat builds. That's more what McKenna brings. Whereas palastri has got those Brazilian delts. The girl looks like she's drinking Paulo Costa secret juices. Okay. We're going to pull it up. We're going to look at this damn scale. We're going to see everything. We're going to see. All right. They got a different order for us. We're going right here. Corey McKenna. She looks like I said, average, average build. She got a new haircut. She's trying a new style. She's trying, to, she's trying to look a little, you know, a little interesting on the scale. What would the word be? She's, she's trying to look more fabulous on the scale. Maybe there's a plan if this fight goes sideways, the OF is opening up. Because a lot of these girls be making killings going from UFC fighter to OnlyFans superstar. And then you see what I'm saying with Palastri? Look at the graininess. Look at the muscle definition. You can actually see it. Palastri's built like a Brazilian. You know what I'm saying? Those, those Brazilian girls got some high testosterone. I swear to you, bro. And then there's the face-off. Look at the difference. Skinny fat versus dense muscle mass. Palastri is the better athlete. I think Palastri is the more dangerous woman. And I think Palastri is going to be the one who takes it home. I'm riding with Julia Palastri to find a way to win. I think she's pulling a W in. As far as the odds, you're looking at McKenna, plus 110. I don't like the plus 110 side. Do you love the Palastri side? No, because she's only one in the freaking UFC. She's a minus 130 favorite. But... Savage for sure. I like the way Palastri fights with pressure, being willing to absorb shots and keep coming and shit. It's a cool style. She's built like a savage. We'll find out. We'll find out. At this level, it's going to be interesting because over freaking two and a half seems highly likely at minus 425. Palastri does bring a sub threat, and I know some people will be asking about the sub line. It's plus 550. Uh, personally, I don't really love the betting side of this fight, and because they're ladies, I really highly anticipate an over two and a half, so maybe the over is something you look to throw in a damn parlay. Uh, the likelihood of Palastri subbing McKenna seems on the lower likelihood side. Not saying it's absolutely impossible, but it's definitely a D-Gen bet chase as opposed to the over, making a lot of sense. It's just chalky as hell. But Palastri is going to be my pick. And uh, I will officially say, I think she gets it done on the judges' scorecards. So we're going Julia Palastri to take it home. I think she's beaten Mary Poppins McKenna. And uh, I think you got to go with the Psycho over Poppins. Nicknames alone, you pick the Psycho every time. I just watched American Psycho the other night. And uh, shit, if that's not a sign to pick Palastri, she's bloodthirsty. McKenna... Nah, Poppins, bro, I'm thinking of like lollipops and Skittles and shit like that, different candies. With Psycho, I'm thinking of chopping up some shit. You know, I don't even want to say it. I'm, I'm thinking of some, some sick shit. And I think Palastri's a sick woman and she's going to win this thing. Let's go. The Psycho for the W. Next fight on the card. We got Junior Taffa versus Sean Sharoff. So I'm picking Junior Taffa. I officially picked him uh, during Moneyline last night. 
And this fight is a late addition. Sharoff coming in on real short notice. He's got balls for stepping in because Tafa's not an easy out. And you got a favorite Tafa to knock him out. You give me a striker on a few days notice who hasn't fought anybody, I'm going to pick Tafa. If Sheriff was a wrestler, we're in a different conversation right now because Junior Tafa has suspicious grappling defense. And when I say suspicious, I don't mean suspiciously good. I mean suspiciously shit. Junior Tafa has essentially no get-up game. His takedown defense isn't awful. His get-up game is atrocious. Now, Sheriff deadlifts like 700 pounds, so don't be surprised if the striker's like, listen, this dude's slicker than me. Let me try to take him down. I just don't think he's going to have the skills to body a Tafa, even though I don't think Tafa's one of the most highly touted guys in the world. I think for this matchup right here, Tafa's hands will be on fire. I think Sheriff is going to come trying to swing bombs, and he's going to get counter shot KO'd. And I won't lie to you, Junior Tafa knocked out Parker Porter. We're going to pull up Sheroff. He looks like Parker Porter with a little bit of higher testosterone and tattoos. We got to look at it. We got to pull it up. Holy shit. Sheroff coming in thick for this one, bro. He's got a little bit of the, uh, the Mickey D titties popping out in this one. He's got the titty McGee's for this fight, but he's a bad man. He's strong. Like, I give the dude respect for taking it. I'm roasting him a little bit because we're having a good time, but dude's an ex-Marine Built like a fucking Mack truck. Doesn't have the abs anymore. He used to be shredded as hell. He's on a fucking forever bulk now. And uh, I guess that's why he's deadlifting 700. I don't know if he's trying to do a thousand pound deadlift. But being a power lifter doesn't mean you're a badass UFC fighter. And I think the transition is, uh, you know, tough is going to be too clean. Tough is going to be too technical with his boxing and kickboxing. I think from distance, his hands are on point. And I expect uh, Sheroff to look to throw too hard and walk into a death punch bomb. What's interesting is Tafa was already a huge favorite going against fan favorite Chris Barnett. When this fight opened up, he was actually a smaller favorite, which is interesting. Expect a finish, expect violence, expect a sick KO. You can see the physique differential between the two. Sheroff looks like a backyard brawling savage, man. He looks like an all-American beast, though. I give credit where it's due. I mean, Sheriff's a strong motherfucker, and he's got balls for taking it on short notice. Extreme couture guy. He trains with Nganu and stuff like that. So maybe he's the hidden, the hidden gem, but uh, I just don't think so. I'm not going off blind faith. I'm going off what I expect. I'm going off evidence, and the evidence tells me this is a knockout win for Junior Tafa. The odds tell me the same. Junior Tafa is a 3-1 to one favorite in this fight over Sean Sheroff, which is a highly likely outcome. I mean, that's what I think is going to happen. I think he's going to get a win. Yes, it's 3-1. to one. I expect this fight to end early. You know Sheroff is a pro, never been outside of the first round. As an amateur, he was outside of the first round once, and he got like a, what, sub-15 second knockout in the second. Dude has never hit the over one and a half mark ever, so you can anticipate this fight being under one and a half. I think Sheriff is going to look to take Tafa's head off early, and I think he's going to get slept because of it. But trust me, he's going to come out chaotic and a dangerous wild man for sure. But I think Tafa finds the kill shot. Now, Tafa by KO, not really exciting, minus 230. Uh, what's Sheriff by KO? Just for the fun of it, plus 325. Tafa wins in round one, plus 105. Tafa by KO in round one, plus 125. I do think he's getting a first round knockout. But uh, I'm not going to be throwing down on a plus 125 first round knockout. If you told me it was plus 400 or even plus 350 like in round two, I'd be a lot more interested. But the fact that you're getting just a little bit more than double your money for throwing a very risky bet down. Because, yeah, I know. Sure, I've never been outside of the first as a pro. There's always a first. And this could be the first time he gets out of the first round. But uh, ultimately, yes, Junior Tafa should whoop his ass and uh, handle him. He should handle him with relative ease. He should, don't handle him with care. You know, he's shipping and delivering a sick KO to the fans. And I think Tafa's going to be back on our radars as a fun guy to watch. Because I'm a little bit bitter. I won't lie to you. I didn't really love his antics after the Volter Walker fight. But he can earn my love back with the sick KO. Tafa for the W. Let's keep running up. Next fight on the card, we have Nico Price versus Themba Garimbo. I'm going with Themba Garimbo in this fight. I've been picking them all week. And if you follow the channel, and if you have for long enough, you know I've been a Themba Garimbo doubter for a very long time. But it's time that I give the man the respect he deserves. He recently transitioned from MMA Masters team to the damn Extreme Couture gym. 
over in Vegas. You see him getting rounds in with Michelle Pereira. It's a really high level gym and I think it works for his style. He's going to be better in his positions where he's already dominant like grappling, but they're going to have some good boxers and kickboxers for him to fine tune his striking skill set with. And he's got a nice knockout in the UFC, but Pete Rodriguez is the guy he chinned. And I think he's an absolute fraud. And at the time I believed in Pete Rodriguez. So listen, I'm roasting him, but I should be roasted too, for God's sake. And last time out, Demba Garimbo did what Garimbo does. He dominated Brahimaj, who was known as a relatively decent wrestler and grappler. And Garimbo gave him the business. Now, Nico Price is talented. Nico Price is powerful. Nico Price has hands, but he don't train as hard as Garimbo. For a fact, Nico Price does not have the same discipline to the game as Garimbo does because he doesn't have plans on making it any farther than where he's really at, which is a fun guy to watch, entertain his style, and he might get a fight of the night, a knockout of the night bonus, or a performance of the night bonus. Demba Garimbo, I truly believe, wants to make a run to the top. Do I think he's going to be successful? No, I don't, and this is harsh. I'm sorry, Garimbo. I will be fading him in the future. But this is a fight that Themba Garimbo should 30-27. And they're giving him a chance to win impressively. If Garimbo goes out and gets a finish of Nico Price, massive for his stock. But I can't sit here with confidence and say that's what I see. I think Garimbo might play it safe with the wrestling heavy game plan. Back Nico up against the cage. Garner some control time. Take him to the ground. Body him there. And cruise to a dominant decision as Garimbo is known for. Garimbo's bread and butter. Dominant decisions. And uh, let's see if that changes. Let's see if that changes. Nico Price looks insane. To be fair, he's in great shape. Me saying he doesn't train as hard as Garimbo doesn't mean he doesn't put in any work. But I think Garimbo is a fighter chasing more knowledge than Nico Price. Price is good at what he's good at. And then we got Garimbo there coming in lean and mean, in shape, on point, ready to kill, ready to go to war. Listen, man, I think we're going to see the side of Themba Garimbo thrive in this one. I do. I truly believe it. I think Garimbo, 30-27, he's a little bit bigger than Nico Price. Price has always been a talented guy, though. And, you know, I had the thought in my mind on Sunday before I did my predictions as I was sitting and doing some research. I'm like, man, I'm like, there is a chance that Nico Price catches him with something weird because that's what he does. But I just can't pick that. Sure, there's always a possibility of a fluke. But I think this version of Nico Price is less likely for a fluke win than uh, him five years ago. So I'm going to ride with Demba Garimbo to find a way, to find the kill. I don't think it's going to be a violent knockout, though. I think it's going to be a pressure grappling game. I think he's going to outwork a Nico Price, and I think he's going to probably cruise to a 30-27. Now, as far as the betting odds for this fight, currently Garimbo is about as chalky as you can get at minus 340. You know, chalky without being unplayably chalky. And Nico Price plus 265. I like the side of Garimbo. I think he is going to take a win home. You got to just parlay the money line probably, especially because they are giving him a chance to thrive. Over one and a half, rather likely minus 215. If you are a sicko though, and you're like, listen, I don't believe in this Garimbo kid at all. And you're like, I want to just fade the narrative, okay? I'm fading The Rock's favorite fighter. The Rock gave him a condo. Nico Price by KO plus 800. For you degenerate savages out there, maybe you're going plus 800 by KO. Nico Price, you think he finds the chin. But I will be picking Garimbo on the cards plus 170. Not nearly as fun, but uh, I can't come here and bullshit with you guys just for a fun line. Like the knockout for Price could be a fun chase of a degen prop bet. But if we're talking actual likely outcomes, more than likely, Garimbo dominates Price in grappling and dominates him on the cards, dominates him, uh, you know, pretty much overall. I'm saying dominate constantly. I feel like the dominator, dominant Cruz, bro. Call me a dominator DeVito over here. And uh, we're going with Demba Garimbo to find the W. I think he's taking a nice one home, and I think he's beating Nico Price. I expect uh, too much with the wrestling specifically. I'd like to see Garimbo showcase some boxing, but I'm not sure that he's going to have the confidence to do it with Nico Price, who's a little awkward on the feet. He's a little herky-jerky and tricky, and he does have power. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, we got Jonathan Pierce versus Pat Sabatini. This is a cool fight. I'm going for Jonathan Pierce, but I'm really interested in seeing how their grappling styles clash. Pierce, more of a wrestling 
based pressure grappler sabatini also brings that pressure with the wrestling but more of a submission finisher the real question mark i have is will pat sabatini be able to threaten a pierce from bottom position because i do anticipate pierce excuse me getting this fight to the ground at some point that that burp was dedicated to sabatini actually shout out to him i think jonathan pierce is the better wrestler sabatini's got tricky jujitsu it's just, what's the likelihood of him catching Jonathan Pierce in a sub? I don't love the chance of it. Pierce is definitely a pressure heavy dog type of fighter. I mean, he's in your face. He's looking to take you down. He's looking to grind out decisions. He's peppering with ground and pound. Not easy to submit. I know he's been submitted before. Two of them outside the UFC. One of them was against damn Joe Anderson Brito. Last time out, Pierce gave Onama a difficult fight. He did lose it. I just, I worry with Sabatini. Bad loss to Diego Lopez, then a win over Lucas Almeida, who has no ground game, and then a Damon Jackson knockout loss. The chin of Sabatini also needs a big question mark around it. And I'm going to pick Jonathan Pierce to snap the two-fight losing streak and get a little traction back on his career. At one point, he was looking like a promising top 15 guy. I think those expectations have kind of fallen off, but I think beating a Pat Sabatini is sensible. And that's what I'm going to predict. Sabatini's absolutely jacked. He's a little short stack savage. The dude came in great shape. And then we got the dead battery tattoo, Jonathan Pierce. I got to say, pound for pound, worst tattoo. You tell me, chat. Let me know in the comments. We going Jonathan Pierce's battery or we're going the double Mickey Mouse thumbs up from Jamal Hill. I want to know in the comments. Let me know. I think two of the worst tattoos in MMA history. They make Brock Lesnar's tattoo look clean art. Look like clean artwork, okay? There's levels to these tattoos. And uh, not feeling Pierce's. Face off, you see Pierce is taller. Another question I ask myself is if these two are striking, how does it go? I feel like Pierce is better at kickboxing. And I don't think Pierce is a great kickboxer. But I think he's better at kickboxing than Sabatini. Add on top of it, the size and the reach advantage. I think Jonathan Pierce is uh, taking a win home this Saturday. So we're going to go with Jonathan Pierce. The odds have him at minus 180 as a bit of a favorite. Not super chalky though, but he's definitely favorite status. Sabatini plus 155. Ah, It's just the money line betting side. It's not for me on this one. It's not for me. I don't like this matchup. There's two guys that... I would say normally I like to pick against. So, you know, I'm not going to go throw money at two guys I like to pick against. Probably over one and a half and minus 350. And then let's see, Pierce by a decision plus 200. Then you got Sabatini by sub. I just, I don't love the chance of Sabatini subbing a Pierce. I know we get high on, oh, he submitted Lucas Almeida. But bro, when you really think about it, he's going to decision with TJ Laramie. Right? Like this fight here, TJ Laramie, he's going to decision with Tucker Lutz. Okay, before that, he had a nice finish. Was it the, the heel hook? Let's double check. It was the, yeah, the heel hook against Jamal Emmers. Okay, he, he beat an Emmers by heel hook in a weird fight. But I think that Jonathan Pierce is going to be too well-rounded, too fit. And I think he probably takes a 29-28, 30-27 type decision. I think it's going to be unanimous. I think Pierce is going to win it, but by no means am I into Pierce's betting side. I'm good, chilling, watching on this one. Good luck if you're on it, though. Next fight is our featured prelim of the night. We have CJ Vergara versus Ramazan Temerov. Listen, 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 listen. I feel like Temerov has that thing. I think Temerov is a special prospect. I have faith that Temorov makes a run to the top 10. And CJ Vergara is not going to be fraud checking this Uzbekistan savage. Temorov's one of those rare cases of flyweights with legit knockout power. He also has what many flyweights have, which is really good athleticism. He's super quick. He's actually got some spinning body kicks he mixes in. He's got nice takedowns. He's got good physical strength. I'd say he's incredibly well-rounded. But what jumps out the page is his damn knockout power. He's got a massive overhand right. And I can see him clubbing CJ Vergara with that right hand. Vergara's got decent stand-up, but it doesn't jump out and say, whoa, Vergara's an okay boxer. He moves decent. He's got light feet. Like, there's things to like. Vergar is a scrappy journey, man. He's a tough customer, but this should be Ramazan Temerov's showcase fight. And I think if you really want to put the damn UFC flyweight on notice, your chin CJ Vergara, many eyes are going to be on him. And I think a lot of people are going to be turning down fights with Temerov. I promise you, 
this Sunday, okay, after Saturday's fights, Temorov is going to be a name that causes fear and panic throughout all of the damn flyweight division. And I think a showcase is going down this Saturday. I had the same feeling with Hamzat. I had the same feeling with Shavkat. I got the same feeling now with the Uzbekistan Savage and Ramazan Temorov too. Look at this guy. He's built like a freaking freight train. He looks like an Uzbek Manny Pacquiao. Look at the goatee on him. The dude's a savage. Built differently. Then you got Vergara, who, you know what? He's in good physical shape, but there's levels to this genetic shit. Temorov's looking like a freak of nature. There's the face-off. Vergara's got the nice man bun, but come on, bro. In the, in the country, Uzbekistan, shit. He ain't walking around with no man bun, bro. He's getting, he's getting locked up for that man bun. Vergara can't rock that style around this Uzbek. I'm going with Temorov. I'm going with knockout. I believe in the violence. And then what's interesting is Temerov also has kind of like a Joker smile. Does he not look like a damn serial killer with that smile? I wouldn't want to be staring across from him smiling at me. If he was in the corner smiling at me right now, I might freeze on camera. I won't know what to do. I start feeling uncomfortable, man. That's a damn smile that haunts your nightmares, bro. And I think uh, that right hand of Temerov is going to put Vergara to sleep. And he'll probably be dreaming of that terrifying smile. So violence incoming, Temerov knockout incoming. Confident pick, Temerov, incoming. Let's go. Temerov's that guy now. I'm a fan already. Minus 315. Listen, 315's a good number on the bench, Paris. I think it's a lucky number. And then uh, Vergara, plus 265. I like Temerov's chances. I think he's going to be violent. I think he's going to be precise. I think he's going to be deadly. I think he's going to be dangerous. And I think Temerov is taking home a knockout. I'm not jumping on a decision. Nah. Plus 250 KO call. I think he's going to chin CJ Vergara. And I'm telling you, there's going to be fear and panic amongst these flyweights because there's a new name coming up right now. It's an, uh, another OV to pick. Another OV to pick consistently. And uh, I think Ramazan Temerov is that guy. Keep your eye on him. Absolute showcase fight in this damn featured prelim. And I personally believe the flyweight division is underrated AF because there's a lot of sick prospects coming in. And I think Temorov adds to that excitement. I'm picking him to get it done. Ramazam, Temorov, W incoming. Let's go. Let's jump to our main card opener. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash the likes. If you're new to the channel, subscribe it up. We got Daniel Rodriguez versus Alex Morono. I've been picking Daniel Rodriguez to get the win throughout the week. I don't know. I've been feeling the D-Rod side. I'm not ready to fade him in this matchup with Morono. I've lost a bit of faith in Morono. I was a consistent Morono picker for a long while, but I feel like he's looked pretty bad in his past two. I mean, this fight here with McGee, he was in a bad spot in round two and he gassed in the third and it didn't look good. He did pull it out, but it didn't look good. Nico Price fight, he ends up losing, and I honestly thought he should have been able to avenge that loss against Nico, but he was dead in the third round. How can I pick a guy who's dead in the third round? The third round cost him against Ponzi, too. He got knocked out after winning the first two. I think Daniel Rodriguez from Southpaw has got the clean boxing. I think Daniel Rodriguez can definitely strike with Alex Morono, but I also feel as though it's going to be harder for that bouncy looping punch style that Morono likes to use to be effective here against D-Rod, who's a relatively clean southpaw. He's got good boxing. He's got decent low kicks. His jab's pretty stiff, and I feel like he works nice and well from the outside with a little bit of a range advantage. That's a factor, and also bring in the fact that Morono likes to throw loopy shit for the most part. I got a favorite D-Rod, and then I think about the grappling I think D-Rod is at the worst competitive with Morono in grappling but could be uh, more physically imposing Morono's got sneaky submission threats but he doesn't really have like uh, an A quality ground game he's not going to be taking you down and grinding out wins and very unlikely we're going to see him toss up a damn triangle from the bottom or any crazy shit like that so expect striking and I expect D-Rod to outwork Alex Morono and uh, get a hard-fought decision. Not an easy fight, but definitely a W incoming, I think, for D-Rod. Let's look at these scales. Let's see what we got. See, we got the weight miss from Frem to look half asleep. We got to scroll past that. We got Alex Morono looking ready to go. He looks crazy. Look at this guy. Gracie Baja for life, dude. Got it tatted on him. He's a Gracie Baja army, bro. Gracie Baja soldier. And then we got D-Rod, who looks like an absolute gangster, bro. He's got the brown pride tattoo 
Shout out Cain Velasquez for uh, bringing that into the UFC. 1986 on his chest. Somehow D-Rod looks younger, bald. That's weird, man. Then there's the face-off. I think D-Rod's got one more good one in him. I don't think it's over. The fat lady ain't singing just yet, okay? And I think we're going to see Daniel Rodriguez take a decision home. I think he's cruising to a, I say cruising like it's going to be easy, but I think he's getting a decision. I think it's going to be competitive striking, but D-Rod's going to be cleaner, and I think D-Rod's taking a W home. Looking at the betting lines, he's minus 210, Morono plus 180. I got to anticipate three rounds of work. The over two and a half sits at minus 180. I think that's going to come to fruition. And also looking at the side of Rodriguez on the judges scorecards plus 160, that's rather likely too. Now, if you're a degenerate, maybe you're going Morono by sub at plus 1200 because he does have an underrated gilly. Uh, but the odds of him locking up a sub on D-Rod, I think are on the lower side. Granted, he got Darce choked by Neil Magny, so something worth mentioning. But I don't know. Neil Magny's got those freaky long arms. That's a worse matchup for D-Rod. In this one, I think his striking style is effective. And I think he's going to win it. So Daniel Rodriguez, D-Rod to start the main card off with a W. He's taking out the Great White. We got the Great White versus Brown Pride in this one. And I'm going with the side of Brown Pride. Let's keep going. Next fight, we have Grant Dawson versus Rafa Garcia. This is a dope fight. Underrated fight because Grant Dawson is consistently slept on and Rafa Garcia is actually slept on too. Uh, but I'm picking Grant Dawson. I'm, I'm not making any crazy mystic Mac call. I hope you weren't sitting there clenching your balls or something like that thinking, no, is he going to pick Rafa? Nah, chill, 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 chill. Grant Dawson should get it done. I feel like the wrestling of Grant Dawson's a massive advantage. Uh, he's definitely more of a position over submission type of grappler, which, you know, for fight entertainment, maybe not the best thing ever. But for value and the guy to bet on, like, shit, you know he's going to win. Like, you know he's going to do his thing. He's going to fight his fight. Yes, that's the type of guy Grant Dawson is. He fights his fight. 21-2 and two as a pro is also a clean-ass record. I know he's got the one draw as well. But still, Grant Dawson's game. Before he got knocked out by Bobby Green, he beat Demir Ismagulov, who I'm botching his name somehow right now. I'm saying all these crazy Russian names all the time, and I'm throwing that one off. I feel like that's still a huge win. I know Bobby put him out in one big shot. Crazy shit happens. After that, he dominates Selecki, who's pretty good at jiu-jitsu. Garcia on the other side, he's a gritty boxer who also has decent wrestling, but I don't think he has the knockout power to deal with Dawson. I know he's got decent hands, but like he's not knocking anybody out. Rafa Garcia hasn't shown any knockout ability, and it would be damn hard for me to say, yo, Rafa Garcia is going to chin Dawson. Nah, I think that would be beyond the stretch. I think that would be unlikely, unreal, unreasonable. I don't think that's happening. I think we're going to see Grant Dawson get a dominant decision. Now, as far as the scales, we got to check out these savages. We got to see what we're working with here. What are we seeing on the scale? Rafa Garcia looks chatted up. The dude shredded and jacked. Respect to Rafa Garcia. He's a tough customer, and that's why I'm picking decision for Dawson. Dawson, holy shit, man. I feel like Grant Dawson didn't look like this a few years ago. He's turned into an absolute monster. He's got the goatee coming in. He's got the tattoo on his forearm. He's got the muscles popping. Grant Dawson, like, if you just covered his body for a second, you know, you just look, you cover the goatee. He looks just like a dorky kid that's good at math. But then you add the physique and tats in. It's like, yo, don't fuck with this guy. And then add in the goatee, aura points plus, I don't know, 50, bro. Plus 50 or more. Big aura. Big aura Dawson. And then there's the face-off between the two. I think Grant Dawson's putting it on him. He's a good prospect. I'll predict this. Grant Dawson wins, and he's going to get a fight in the top 15, 2025, or if he fights one more time this year. It's time for Grant Dawson to get some respect. And I'm giving it to him. Dawson for the W. Now, as far as the odds, yes, Grant Dawson is minus 350. He's a huge favorite, but come on, bro. That's what he deserves. He should be this big of a favorite. Plus 275 for Rafa Garcia. I like the side of Dawson at minus 350. And then uh, let's see what else we got. What are we working? What magic? Can we concoct any magic? Over two and a half minus 265. Boring, but probably. Uh, let's see. Where's the fun, though? Let's have a good time. Minus 150 decision. That's 
better, but still not great. I want to find big plus money. You can't even find it. Dawson by KO. Dawson hits him with a right. If Dawson knocks Rafa Garcia out, I'm going to be damn shocked. Plus 1,000 for it. I don't think so. Decision, probably the second most likely method at plus 350, but come on. It's going to be Grant Dawson embracing the grind. Submission plus 350. Decision minus 150. The official method of victory prediction is going to be Grant Dawson on the scorecards. And I can tell you to chase and have fun. Chase the sub. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going with high confidence. And I think Dawson straight down the center in a parlay is a lock. So Grant Dawson, lock him up. And uh, you know what I'm saying? Let's catch a W this weekend. Let's go. Grant Dawson, put him in your parlay. I think that's where he's at. He's not money lineable unless you're throwing like 50K type shit at it. But uh, he's definitely a proven winner and a bad matchup for Rafa Garcia. Dawson for the win. Let's keep running. Our next fight on the card, we have Chidi Bang Bang Njokowani versus Jared Gooden. And guess who misses weight? Jared Gooden does. Chidi and Jaquani has talked about it's a hard weight cut to 170. I hate doing it. And Jared Gooden comes in overweight. Interesting. Gooden's off weight. Shit. 72 and a half. So not like a crazy miss, but it's still a pound and a half over. And uh, Njokowani came in at 70 and a half. Listen, I've been going with Chidi Bang Bang and Jaquani because I like his kickboxing style. He's going to have a distance striking advantage. I think he throws nice teeps. He's got good elbows on the inside. He's pretty quick and slick. And I've been a Chidi and Jaquani fan for a very long time. I remember watching him in Bellator back in the day. And then to see him get to the UFC, I was excited. He fell on hard times and he lost three in a row. But Gregory Rodriguez is a monster and he gave Gregory a gnarly cut. Okay. Albert Doraev, it was a really competitive fight, and Doraev's a pressure grappler. And then Oleg J. Chuck, he was winning, then he got caught. This is age pretty bad. But then he decides to drop down. Reese McKee split decision. It wasn't a split decision, okay? He won that fight for sure. The split decision will make you apprehensive picking him. Chidi's better than the damn Reese McKee fight, okay? And then we look at the other side. Jared Gooden, he's coming off the Wellington Terman win. But he was getting hurt in round one by Wellington Terman, who's a jiu-jitsu fighter. Carlston Harris got a dominant decision on him. I'm going Chidi Bang Bang. And I'm going Chidi Bang Bang by KO. The way Gooden stands is like he's a slickster, okay? He's got that lead hand low. Looks like he's training at City Kickboxing. The way he fights is a bite down on your mouthpiece brawler. And I think that he's going to get chinned. There is Jared Gooden on the scale, missing weight, 72 and a half. And they brought the box out for him. And again, he looks a little bug eyed. Look at Gooden's eyes. Is he there? Jared Gooden looks gone. There's, there's no water in his damn brain here. I don't know. The cell membrane is dying or something like that. He looks freaky there. He looks out of it. He's looking one way, looking the other. That's not a guy who beats Chidi and Jaquani. Look at this freak. Chidi and Jaquani is a monsoon. He looks like a damn Muppet in that picture. But forget about that picture, okay? Chidi and Jaquani is ready for war. He's ready for violence. And I think he's bringing home a massive win. There's the face-off. You can see the little... Big lip tattoo on Jared Gooden on the side. Damn, that's a big lip tattoo. Somebody who kissed him there got some big lips. And uh, Chidi and Jaquani not getting, not getting kissy like Marab with uh, Gooden. I think he's going to be mean with his elbows. And I think Chidi Bang Bang by KO. That's going to be the official call. I'm ready to see Chidi chin Jared Gooden. And I'm ready for some violence. As far as the odds, minus 155 for my guy, Chidi Bang Bang. They could be sleeping on him because of his last fight with McKee. And I think good and, uh, you know, powerful, but not that technically clean. He's a dog that you're chasing, but I think you're chasing it hard. I think Chidi Bang Bang's going to find the kill. Plus 135 on that good inside. And then looking towards the side of prop betting, if you're interested, and fight ends inside distance at minus 200, I'll anticipate violence, and I am going to predict the finish. Uh, Enja Kawani to win by KO is plus 160. Very unlikely at plus 2,000 he's getting a submission, but it's fun to read it off. How many sub wins does Chidi have? If it's top of my head, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, one submission win. He's not awful on the ground, though. Yeah, I think it's unlikely, though, that he's submitting good. And I think more likely it's a KO for Chidi Bang Bang or you're playing the money line. Chidi's going to be a confident pick for me. And, uh, you know, I'm a fan, guys. I'm a, I'm a fan of Chidi Bang Bang. I've been on the Bang Bang train for years, and I'm not jumping off. I'm not jumping ship, okay? I'm sticking with my guy. And uh, the bang bang train gonna run over the night train and uh, put bug eyes out. Chidi and Jakawani for the knockout. Let's go. Let's go. Let's keep running. Next fight. Co main event of the evening Brad Tavares versus John Young Park. 
I'm going with Jung Young Park. You think I'm fading the Iron Turtle? Come on. Come on. Have a little respect. Have a little respect for the South Korean savage. Jung Young Park's a menace to society. Jung Young Park's a mean man. He's actually a really, he seems like a really nice guy. I'm, I'm, I'm hyping him up crazy. His skills are good though. I feel like he's very fine tuned. He's going to be able to outwork a Brad Tavares. I feel like he's kind of got him beat everywhere. I would favor boxing, uh, Jun Young Park. Kicking, Jung Young Park. Wrestling, Jun Young Park. Jiu Jitsu, Jung Young Park. But there's a flip side to that coin. Brad Tavares has pretty good takedown defense. So I'm not saying that Park can just out dog him in wrestling. I'm also just saying that Tavares landing key takedowns on Park, rather unlikely. And then when you look at the striking, I feel like Tavares has enough power to get respect, but he doesn't have knockout ability at all. He's got a bit of power, but like I don't think of him as a heavy handed guy. He hits you hard enough that maybe you don't blitz him like a madman, but he's not a violent KO artist or anything like that. Now, as far as Park, he's got more clean striking and I think he's got more hand speed than uh, the side of Tavares. And I think he's a little more well-rounded, right? Like I said, I think he's got him beaten all areas. And I think if it's a knockout, it's Park getting a KO. If it's a sub, which is unlikely, it's Park getting a sub. And if it's a decision, it's Park getting a decision. John Young Park should dominate this fight. Brad Tavares is one in three out of his last four. The sole win was a wash Chris Weidman. He got a loss to Gregory Rodriguez by violent knockout. Now, Rodriguez is a savage, but Park gave him a dif difficult-ish fight. Bruno Silva, violent KO. And then Duplessis, the damn champ, goes a distance. The most impressive name on it, and it's Duplessis taking him long. Duplessis lost that first round too, and he had to come on strong in the second, third. But either way, different time, different fight. This is the Jung Young Park era, and uh, I think Iron Turtle's going to get the win. He's going to get back on track with a nice W, and I think he's beaten Brad Tavares. I and mean, for Tavares, he's at home in Vegas. Uh, I think he's taking an L at home. I'm going with Team Iron Turtle for the W. I got to ride with this Asian sensation. Look at this savage, meme-worthy fighter, Jun Young Park, who if he got the decision against Muniz, which could have went his way, it was a 50-50 decision, could be on a five-fight win streak. Then we got Tavares on the other side, flexing the bicep. Bro, he's got the grays coming in. Isn't Tavares looking a little old? Am I being a hater or is he looking a little old? Let me know in the damn comments. Come on. Then we got the face-off. Respect. Respectable clash, okay? The opposite of what we saw. Jared Gooden didn't even want to shake hands with Chidi and Jukawani. Respect, Chidi. Park is bowing to Tavares and shit. Shaking his hand. Yes, yes. Hello. I love it, bro. Jung Young Park is that guy, and I'm rooting for him. He won't even look Tavares in the eye. That's so much respect he has for his foes. But uh, shit, you don't have to look him in the eye. You're going to punch him in the face. As far as the odds, Park is minus 190. Yes, he should win. Tavares plus 165, the Iron Turtle to take it home, representing South Korea with the Savage W. Over, I think you could be playing with fire because Tavares' chin might be gone. I just like the money line of Park, to be honest with you. You got plus 350 for a Park KO and then a Park decision plus 130. I really favor the outcome of Park by decision, but I don't think it's crazy that he could drop some hammers on Brad Tavares. I mean, Park's got some KOs in the mix. Got the subs there. Damn, what the fuck? You know what's crazy? I, I don't... I didn't... I said I didn't consider it. I mentioned it throughout the week. It's not the first time we talked about this fight. But is the sub line the D-Gen call? Plus 900 by sub. How many submission losses though Tavares got? He never been subbed. Yeah. See, even though Park's got some submission threats, the guys he's subbing, Darayev... Granted, Darayev's actually like kind of good on the ground. Tolulin's mid... Uh, Holmes mid and then split decision with Anders. So what I'll tell you is Tavares resembles the Eric Anders type build. And that's why I'm thinking decision. It could be a kind of difficult fight for Park, similar to that Anders fight where he's tested a bit. So the official pick is decision. I know we have fun and get carried away talking props because it's fun to chat about big plus money and maybe throw on it some degeneracy type shit. But most likely I'm saying Park is taking home a win on the judges' scorecards, and he should outwork a Brad Tavares over three hard rounds. And that is my official prediction. But if Tavares' chin is gone, he can get he can get chinned or he can get club and sub. Let's jump to the main event of the evening. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe it up. We got Brandon Royval versus Tatsuru Tyra. I'm going with Brandon Royval to win. Yeah, I'm riding with him. 
I've been picking him all week long, and I think he's being slept on. Brandon Roy Vall is extremely skilled, and he's evolved a ton. He's 32 years old. He's in his absolute fighting prime. He's coming off the biggest win of his life against Brandon Moreno, the former champion. And he's a big underdog in this fight against Tyra, whose biggest W is last time out, injuring Alex Perez. Come on now. Roy Vall's a dangerous southpaw, high volume, good gas tank, nasty striking. He's good in close. He's got elbows and knees in close. He's good from the mid-range with his hands, and he can kick really nice, too, from the outside. And on the ground, Roy Vall's got a nice jujitsu skill set. Why is Tyara this big of a favorite? I don't understand it. Now, to be fair, Tyara has showcased some really nasty submission skills, a good grappling game, strong control. But let's not forget, just three fights ago, Edgar Shirez, who has a similar frame to Roy Vall, had him in a fully locked-in ghillie to end the fight from Mount. And if there was 15 more seconds, Tyara's going to sleep. So that's a factor. That's a red flag. He lost the first round to Alex Perez. And if it was, oh, well, I think he won it. It was damn close. He got touched a bit. He works a lot of straight punches, being Tyara. But he's kind of stiff. He doesn't have great head movement. He's got solid grappling for sure, but I'm just not sold that he's ready for Royval. He's only 24. And you're telling me that this is the lock. This is the guy. I just don't see it. I just don't believe it. I'm underdog locking Brandon Royval, my favorite dog on this card. I think Raw Dog Royval is more than live. I think he is probably going to end up hurting Tyar on the feet and locking in a submission. But if it goes long, Royval is ready for five hard too. We've seen it. We've seen it. We haven't seen that in the UFC with Tyra. Outside of Perez, what's the biggest win for him? Oh, he knocked out Carlos Hernandez. Does that mean a lot when you're fighting a Royval though? Like, be real with me. Royval debuted and subbed up a damn Tim Elliott, who's good. He finished Kaikara France. He has fought twice with Pantoja and in the second fight had good moments. And he fought twice with Moreno, beating him in the second fight, avenging that loss. Carlos Hernandez win for Tyra. Edgar Shirez, who almost submitted him. Jesus Aguilar. CJ Vergara. Just to name, uh, you know, a few, okay? Come on. Come on. Carlos Candelario before that. And that equals win over Brandon Royval. And that equals minus 300 favorite status. A win over Perez where you injured him. Who knows how that fight would have played out if there was more time of, you know, no injury for Perez. Sure, you can say, oh, but Tyra injured him. It was a sick technique. It, it was a, a sick trip. But come on. Tell me with a straight face that is not an overinflated line for what the resume tells us. If Tyara was Steve Smith, this would be even line at best. He might be a plus 180 underdog. I'm picking Raw Dog Roy Vall, and I think everybody's sleeping on him. He's being disrespected completely. And I'm not going to sit here and disrespect Raw Dog Roy Vall, who's fought for the belt, who just beat Brandon Moreno, who's extremely talented. There's Tyara. He looks great on the scale. He's a great prospect. He's only 24, though. And then there's Raw Dog Roy Vall. Looks ready for war. He's got the earrings in. Look at this guy. He's got those skinny arms, which I think is money for submissions. He's got those long legs, good for kicking. And then there's the face-off between the two. You can see Roy Vall a little bigger. We've never seen Tyara face anyone near Roy Vall's level. No one near it. And I think that Brandon Roy Vall is going to be the one that fraud checks him. Now, I don't think it's over for Tyara with a loss. I'm not saying he has no UFC future, but he's only 24. And he's gotten on the fast track now, fighting all the time. Respect to it. He's fighting at the apex consistently. And this fight here is also at the apex. And I think Brandon Roy Vall is going to beat Tyara at home, which is the apex. And I think uh, big finish coming, big upset coming. And uh, love this fight. Holy shit. This is actually a really great fight. Sick main event for the Apex. They're coming through. We wish there was a damn crowd. Imagine they brought this damn fight in front of a crowd. I think people would be blessed to see it live. But instead, only a few rich folks at the Apex. I hope that if any of you are going to the Apex, you guys enjoy. I will be right here streaming for the whole card. Minus 285 for Tyara. Tell me why. Tell me why he opened up at minus damn 350. And then the line flipped. Then the line got close to flipping, not all the way. Then he's minus 160, right? A little money coming in on and off, and now he's a big favorite again. Roy Vall, big plus money. 
Everybody's locking Tyra. I don't agree with it. He hasn't proven it to me yet. And I like his style. I think he's a fun guy to watch. And I think he's got a great future. I'm just not here picking him against Brandon Royval at 24 years old. He's not beating the 32-year-old primed Brandon Royval. I don't see it. I don't see it. Underdog pick in the main event. Hey, I picked Money Moicano too. Don't forget about it. Royval submission. Okay, if you go for that, plus 1,400, that could be a crazy D-Gen bet. Roy Vol, inside distance, plus 500, and then decision, plus 450. You can have a little fun with the D-Gen props, and then if you're going and hammering the underdog on Team Roy Vol, you're riding with Roy Vol with me, plus 245, big plus money on a guy who I think is being completely disrespected by not only the bookies, but the damn fans and the damn UFC. Because Tyara, I don't think he's ready for this level just yet. I think it's too big of a jump. A little too little, too soon type thing. And you can see 78% of the masses are on Tyra. Only 22% of topology picking Roy Vol. And I guess I'm in the minority. But I'm curious. In the comments, let me know. You team Roy Vol? Or you team Tyara, I want to hear from the people. Definitely drop that in the comments. Now, those are the final predictions for this week's UFC Vegas 98 card. But we're not done. Because we have to talk some post-weigh-in parlays. Does anything change? Well, first and foremost, Ramazan Temerov and Grant Dawson still seems like a very safe play to me. But damn, it's no fun because you got, what, minus 150 on the tag? That's kind of disappointing. Now, if you feel as though Themba Garimbo could be filled in as a three chalky play, you get plus 118 if all the chalky lockies come through. But if you're like, I want something a little more valuable, but somebody you still feel confident in winning, I think we could add in the, the damn Enja Kawani call, plus 169. I almost called him the damn night train. That's funny. I think you could throw Park in your mix too. It's plus 313 for that. If you don't like Chidi Bang Bang, but you like Park, it's plus 155. Now, if you're like, listen, I love the OVs normally, but I'm just not picking a guy debuting. I think you're making a mistake because he's going to win. Just Dawson and Park together gives you minus 104 and doesn't seem like a horrible call. You could actually add in some steam by going with the side of Raw Dog Royval. Now you got plus 585, throwing in a big heater at the end of the night. You got savage mode at the end. Now, if you believe in my flyweight predictions, because I think I'm pretty good with them, add in Temerov, plus 793. Plus 793 is money. I also think Clayton Carpenter is live to win. Plus 1228. But if you're like, I'm not betting no debuting guy, understood. Do you think Junior Toff is winning? He's probably getting a KO. What's the KO line available? Minus 225? Now you got plus 1189. I think this could win too. If you don't want to play the side of the underdog in the main event, you want to take it out, we still got you, what, a decent little plus tag if you add in Toffa, who should get a KO. Plus 239. You add in the ladies over, which is relatively likely. You get only a few points. Not really worth adding in for the most part. In certain parlays, it will be. But with this one, maybe not as much. And then what do we like from here? Is there any magic I can concoct? Dawson, Park, Temerov, Tafa, Clayton Carpenter, plus 404. It makes a lot of sense. Demba Garimbo, too, could be a guy you add in. But I like mixing in a dog in the lineup. Dan Argetta could also be added, but note that he missed weight, right? So there's got to be a relative concern out there for this damn weight miss. The Pierce Sabatini fight, I'm chilling. I'm sitting on the damn sidelines. I went through a slew of props throughout this week's best MMA bets, and I'll just quickly pop them up on screen. We had a whole slew of them that we talked about. And I feel as though how I look at it, I mean, it still kind of stands, but we lose the Al Hassan KO, unfortunately. That's uh, voided out because uh, he ain't fighting. But I think those are still pretty money, but there's more you could even add to it with somebody that looked good on the scale, uh, you know, like a Themba Garimbo or somebody who looked solid like a damn Clayton Carpenter. But if you don't want these young debuting guys, I, I don't think it's crazy to avoid things like that. And then maybe you're throwing in an over in the ladies fight, something along those lines. I do have faith in my guy Temerov, though. I do. I want to just make that loud and clear. I think this dude is legit AF. And I think that I'm great at flyweight predictions. So maybe Temerov, Carpenter, and Raw Dog Royval plus 579 close you out. Bet it intelligently. Now you got my picks. Now you know my head's out with some of the parlays. But you got to do your own damn research, man. Don't slack on it. Put in the work, okay? 
Do your research. Don't just blindly tail, especially if you're betting substantial cash at these fights. I hope you guys enjoyed this week's weigh-in recap show. I know I did. Doing it in a different spot than normal, but thankfully, there's power right here at my buddy's place, and we got the show locked and loaded. I appreciate you all for watching. Smash the likes. If you're new, subscribe. I'll be live for the whole card, so I will see you guys at the Fight Companion. If you got nothing to say in the comments, drop a W to boost the algorithm for your boy. The hurricane ain't stopping me. I'm still bringing the fire. Thanks, guys. See you soon. Peace out. Thank <laughs> you.